Well, welcome to the Follow the Money in Healthcare panel. Uh, before we begin, uh, we acknowledge the land and the people of this land. The University of Montana acknowledges that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today, we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come, which is really appropriate for our topic. I'm Sue Kirchmeyer, and on behalf of Montana's Move to Amend, I and Joe Lowe's are happy to present the Follow the Money in Healthcare panel, along with co-sponsors, the Missoula League of Women Voters. Nancy, do you want to stand up? Um, Montford. Is there anybody from Montford here? I know the rest of the folks in Montford. And uh, the Jeanette Rankin, uh, no, from Edwards. And the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center. Carol? Great. We also thank Missoula Community Access Television. The panel is being recorded and live streamed by MCAT as part of a media assistance grant donated to us by MCAT. For housekeeping information, uh, please help yourself to the refreshments. The restrooms are located across the foyer to the right of the elevator. Uh, so this is a big topic. And we're lucky to have a panel with so much knowledge and on-the-ground experience with our health care system. This is not going to be a, 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 well, I can't think of it, but in any case, you'll hear a lot of people from people who really know. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Tom Roberts, MD, who a lot of you know, who practiced as a general internist and president of the Western Montana Clinic, and how is co-founder of the Montana Health Co-op. Um, who, along with the other panelists, has been totally generous and um, persistent in helping us um, put this together. So thank, thank them for us, if you would. Um, yeah, well, thanks, guys, for coming out tonight. Um, obviously, this is a topic of, uh, of interest that we're going to hear a lot about um, over the next year in the election cycle. Um, I thought I would say a few words uh, about uh, what we talk about tonight, but then I realized that these guys were going to say a whole lot, and um, I already wrote the editorial, so uh, you know what I think. Um, so uh, the, the format that we're going to use is that we'll have uh, these guys speak, and I'll introduce them, and then um, we can try to keep it to about 10 minutes uh, and somebody's timing. Um, but if they really go over, um, like I know Marilyn's got to talk really fast and get all her stuff in, um, and I'll <clears throat> intervene. Um, but uh, these are, we're really lucky to have these folks come and talk to us tonight. Um, uh, they're actually people that I've known and worked with for a long time. Um, even Marilyn, who I had only met recently, but I spent a lot of time struggling with. Uh, her predecessor at the state. Um, so I feel like I know you well, Marilyn. Uh, Dick Barrett is a professor emeritus, very important uh, position here in uh, uh, Missoula. Uh, and I tease him constantly, Dick and I do a lot of things together. He's also a, a very active state senator, um, very knowledgeable economist, and uh, a very thoughtful guy. Sitting to his left is uh, Jim Edwards. Jim has gotten me in more trouble than I would like to imagine. He always came up with another new project uh, during my career that he thought I would be should be involved in. Uh, but Jim is uh, is a real thinker and an advanced uh, uh, guy who has been able to put up with a lot of stress and a lot of uh, issues dealing with insurance and hospitals and. <laughs> Doctors, especially, I think, um, and me. Um, so uh, he's great. He's really fun. And to his left is Marilyn uh, Bartlett, uh, who is um, uh, an accountant by training, but has spent a huge amount of her time um, advocating for us uh, as a uh, how do we get the money. Um, uh, follow the money and reduce what we're spending in healthcare. And she is a whiz. And uh, you'll be impressed with her tonight. Uh, she 
worked with the state health plan uh, here in Montana and saved us millions and millions of dollars, over 100 million, she'll talk about that, um, and is now carrying her expertise around the country, uh, working with the uh, National Association of State Health Plans and helping them to make uh, wise choices. And she'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And sitting to her left is Mark Mantell, um, a TO, a very um, thoughtful um, physician who uh, has already got a distinguished career, and he's not even um, that old. Oh, I'm old. <laughs> I, don't, I feel it in the morning when I wake up. <laughs> Mark is uh, currently president of the Montana Medical Association, which uh, is a total pain in the butt, but um, you need somebody to stand up and do that. And so he really represents the doctors in the state. He also is um, currently the um, director of the task force on drug substance abuse mm -hmm. for the um, medical association and has really struggled with how physicians can uh, deal with uh, substance abuse in their patients and, and limit that. Uh, so he's been very active in some good things. Uh, not only that, he's taken the job of being the medical director for the Western Montana Mental Health Clinics which encompasses a large part of Western Montana, if I'm not mistaken, is that yes. Mark recently? Mm -hmm. um, so he's um, looking out for our mental health, and mental health for our population. Um, and uh, he, before that, was working with a residency program here in, in town um, and was a professor with, with that. Uh, so uh, you can see that uh, these folks know more than any of us put together, uh, and they're going to share that with us starting with uh, Dick. Oh, the questions. Let me say one more thing about the questions. I don't think I covered that. If you have questions, we're going to take them at the end. So what we're going to try to do is a discussion after um, the presentation. So if you think of questions, uh, Nancy over here uh, in the purple uh, will collect them. Uh, she'll are going to walk around and get them, Nancy? Actually, um, Carol's going to collect them. Okay. And I'll sort them right here and then feed them to you. Yeah, and so after the discussion, well, we're not going to open it up to like raise your hand stuff, but I'll sort through the questions and uh, and then present them and, and uh, sort of be the moderator. I'll try to be the moderator. Um, and we'll see how that works. I mean, if we need to degenerate into like an argument or something, we can do that too. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, good to be here. I'm glad he didn't comment on everybody's age. <laughs> Just the young ones. I was telling Ed Bartlett a moment ago that um, I probably taught 100, 200 classes in this room. But it was a long time ago. 2012, I retired from the university. So, uh, but I did teach a lot here. It's good to be back. It's good to be with you. And thanks for asking me to participate. Um, we have 10 minutes, so I'm going to go pretty fast, um, get ask questions at, afterward. So I'm going to start with this. I think that the problem that we're talking about tonight is what we want to talk about is the fact that health care in the United States is very costly. Uh, and we know that. I think everybody's sort of familiar with that idea. That health care is very costly. And it presents a particular, we, we want to know why that is, so that one of the questions that we want to look at is, is, is um, why is health care so costly? And the other question is, uh, given that it's that costly, what can we do to make sure that everybody universally has affordable access to health care? Um, given that very serious constraint that we have about how much health care costs. First piece of evidence that you can look at here is this. Um, it's pretty. Um, Common information says it compares uh, per capita, 2018 per capita healthcare costs in the United States to other countries. Uh, and you can see that in the United States, uh, per capita healthcare is $10,586. Every man, woman, and child in the country, $10,586. Uh, and that's, as you can see, well above um, the, the cost for other high-income countries. 
Um, the closest one is Switzerland at 7,300. The average for OECD countries, that's the Organization for Economic Cooperation, Cooperation is uh, 4,000. So that's one, one piece of evidence. The other piece of evidence is this, which is um, not only in terms of the absolute dollars, but in terms of the share. This is a, a pretty stunning figure. 16% of the GDP of the United States is in healthcare. 16%, that's, that's a pretty stunting figure, really, when you think about it. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask you to remember both of those figures because they're going to figure in what I'm talking about before. So, what we said what we're going to do here is uh, follow the money. And see if we, by following the money we can uh, figure out the, something about these two questions. One is the question of um, why it costs so much, and the other is how can we, how can we get, make sure that people have access, affordable access. Uh, and so um, I'm going to follow the money now. Where does the money come from? It comes from us, it comes from households. All the money ultimately that's going into the, into the, into the healthcare system is coming from households, okay? in one form or another. Not Maybe not directly, but in one form or another. And so we're going to take the money from households and we're going to give it to healthcare providers, hospitals, doctors, drug companies, all of those folks that we spend that, uh, all that money on. And so how do we follow the money? And I'm assuming that you will know a lot about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But uh, one way is households directly pay healthcare providers, private pay patients, for example, pay them, or What's a very significant matter for, for some people is co-pays and deductibles. Um, and those have been, become a real bone of contention. Another way, of course, is uh, through private insurance, through employers. Uh, these are, this is, a lot of people are insured that way. Another way is through uh, other private insurance, and particularly in this connection, we're interested in the exchanges under the uh, ACA, the Obamacare. Uh, so there's money going there, uh, but of course then there's the other big player is government. And it's not just the federal government, you have to understand state governments have a very big role in this as well, particularly when it comes to the issue of, of uh, um, Medicaid, Medicaid expansion and so forth. So we have governments and of course governments get their money from households. Okay, how? Well, taxes or they borrow. Uh, and then what do they do with it? Well, um, a big chunk of it goes to Medicare for folks over 65. Another ch chunk goes to Medicaid. So there's the money going on. A few other things to pay attention to is that um, households uh, directly contribute through premiums and payroll deductions directly contribute to Medicare. Uh, and the federal and state governments, federal government in particular, uh, directly pays for some private insurance through um, both the subsidies under the ACA and the exchanges, and it also pays through um, the uh, th through um, um, the Medicaid Advantage funds. So there's money that goes from government to private insurers in that way. And then the last thing you might take note of is uh, is that government does do some direct provision of medical care through things like the VA or the Indian Health Service or community health centers. So that's, a, that's the way the money is flowing from households to the healthcare system. What can we possibly learn from this uh, about the problems that we're talking about, which is the problem of cost and the problem of affordability? Uh, I think that there's three things that I want to say. One is, at a 10,000, whatever it was, how many dollars was it, 10,000 or something about what I said? There is no way that you can have affordable health care without, without government subsidy. If there's no, if, if everybody, if the average is 10,000, then for it to be affordable for low income people, they have to pay less than 10,000, they can't pay 10,000. That's, remember it's per capita. So somebody has to pay more than the average. Higher income people have to pay me more. How is that going to happen? It can only happen through government. So you you have to have 
government participation in, 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 in order to make health care affordable for everybody. It doesn't make it necessarily going to happen, but you have to have it. The other thing is that, uh, in terms of affordability, the other uh, issue in private insurance is that, of course, that if in a private insurance market, if you begin to develop a, um, a, a high and low risk pools, if the market begins to develop high and low risk pools, you, you're going to have people who can no longer afford uh, to, uh, to, to, to buy health insurance because they're in a high risk pool. They may not be able to get any in, 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 uh, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Talk for the rest of the hour, right? I mean, what? Have to say for another hour. Actually. Well, okay. Um, and the last thing I'll say then about this is that, the, that when it comes to the question of costs, not all the money that starts at the top there gets down to here. Not all the money uh, get, get close from the top gets to the bottom because there are insurance costs. Okay, and those insurance costs vary depending on uh, which. Uh, path this money is taking. Insurance costs, the overhead costs of providing insurance are lower for Medicare and Medicaid than they are for uh, private in uh, insurance through the employer, and which are in turn lower than other private insurances. So it depends on what, which, which way you're looking at, but there's costs there. Um, and so that's part of the, of the picture of costs. Now, uh, the next thing that you have to look at, God, I can't believe this. <laughs> Are you sure you made it that right? She started it at five minutes. Uh, the, 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 ne the next thing you have to look at is, well, what's inside this little box here? Because, uh, okay, the money's all gotten to here. Now what happens? Uh, and so we'll look inside that little box, and I'm... Uh, it's a complicated picture, but I'm going to rely heavily on this article, which I recommend to you, um, which came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association last year, Waste in the U.S. Healthcare System. What, these author, what the authors of this study did was they looked at waste, what they considered waste, or excessive ex costs, or excessive expenses in the healthcare system. And, whoops. And here's what they... Here's, here's the kinds of waste that they, that they discover. Failure of care delivery, failure of care coordination, over-treatment or low-value care. Those numbers in parentheses are the amount of, of excess cost in billions, oh in billions, um, that these guys identify. That's the upper end. I, and I, I, put, I put the upper end into shocking more. Okay. Uh, but it comes out to 25% of total health care spending in their calculation. Waste is 25% of health care spending. One minute, she's saying. Don't waste. I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> One last point that I want to make about this when we're looking at these costs and these excess costs. In, um, in in the healthcare system, one of the things we have to refer back to is the is the payment system, um, and, and, and what it looks like. Because the payment system is implicated in in, in, in the creation of, or in the incurring of some of these costs. Um, for example, that spaghetti bowl that you saw a, a little bit ago. Uh, is responsible for a lot of complexity that adds to the cost of administering the healthcare system. Okay. Um, but there are other things. There are also, in that payment system, there's the issue of how bargaining power can be applied uh, to negotiating healthcare costs. There's also the idea of uh, the way that healthcare providers are paid creates incentives for them to, um, to economize or not economize as the case may be. Uh, so uh, these costs within the healthcare system are not just sort of 
30 seconds, independent of, uh, are, are not independent of the, um, uh, of, of the way in which uh, the people are paid, or the, the providers are paid. Um, so, one other thing that I, and I'm, I'm just going to have to quit, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to talk about all the healthcare, I, I, I'll come back, you can ask, here's the, here's the, <laughs> ask me, what about some of the reform proposals, and then I'll have another slide. <laughs> good, that's I'm, good. I'm, I'm going to leave it right here now with this one additional observation. It would be very nice, we would all like to hope, that all of this excess cost in the system, that the, the excess costs here, if there are excess costs in the insurance overhead, it would be very nice to know that that all represented monopoly profits okay, of some kind, or that it represented um, excess payments uh, to hospital administrators or brain surgeons or, or something like that. But it's not true. It's not true. If you look at the nature of these excess costs, if you, if you take, for example, excess administrative costs associated with trying to deal with the complexity of the system, we're talking about the jobs and wages of accountants. No, or, we're needed. What? We're needed. We're indispensable. <laughs> and they're all going to say that. So are insurance consultants. They're all going to say yeah, that. So. But case find managers that work for insurance companies or clerks or data crunchers or all these kinds of folks, normal folks like you and me, who are going to work and earning this, this, this income. And when you talk about taking that away, when you talk about cutting costs, you're talking about taking away those jobs. And you're talking, and I stop, I'm going to say well, one more sentence. Uh, and, and, and I'm about to tackle you, Dick. Just, 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 take away those jobs, and you're going to take away that. And the magnitude of this thing is enormous. Go back to that 16% of GDP. Now imagine that you're going to cut health care costs by a modest target at 25%. You're, you're talking about, I'm getting you. You just stay a little bit longer. Uh, uh, you're talking about um, reassigning 4% of the gross domestic product. That's a huge thing. That's bigger than the kind of impact that NAFTA has on the economy. So it's a real constraint on what you can do. Don't start timing me yet. We <laughs> have a few extra, few extra minutes there. Okay. Start timing her. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> So, so if you have questions, just hold your card up and Carol will come get it. Yes, you can get a replacement. Well, thank you. Is this on? Yes. Um, I'm Marilyn Bartlett, and I'm going to be speaking to you a little bit about uh, what I did when I was administrator of the State Employee Health Plan. I'm not there anymore. I now work for the National Academy of Student Health Policy out of Washington, D.C., and uh, but we're still working in the same area. So I started with the state of Montana plan in late 2014, and Jim's wife, Sheila Hogan, hired me. And we put our heads together to come up with this plan. In 2015, early 2015, the actuary presented this report to the Montana legislature that if we didn't do something drastic, our plan was going to be at minus nine million reserves by the end of 2017. The legislature passed Senate Bill 418 that said, you've got to do something to turn that around, it, or there'll be no employee pay raises. So it was limited raise that year. And they said, we're tired of just giving you more and more and more money. You gotta figure it out. So the first thing we did was figure out where are our costs? 
we had a hard time getting to the data, which was uh, the Cigna, a large carrier. We were able to get the data and we found 43% of the spin was with the Montana hospitals. But 87% of that blue chunk were the 11 acute care hospitals. Only 13% were the critical access hospitals, 48 critical access hospitals. So we said, let's start there. So we started studying costs. And this is, not, this is the chart we used then, and it's still the same now. Whether it's outpatient care or inpatient care, price is the issue, I contend. Here you'll see the lower line is utilization and severity. Dropping for inpatient, kind of flat for outpatient, but look at what price was doing. I just looked at the chart from Healthcare Cost Institute that was just updated for the last five years. It's this same picture. <coughs> outpatient, though, has gone up 0.3% over five years, but price has gone up well over 20 on each of them. So we started looking how we reimburse hospitals, and it's the typical charge master rate less a negotiated discount that's in a black box. You'll never know what it is. You won't know the charge master, and you won't know the discount, but you're paying the bill. And what we, I did this chart, just a little Excel graph that we could show the legislature to say, see, the blue line, that's the charge master. The green line is our discounted rate. No matter what we negotiate, we're going to follow that same trend. We've got to change this. So we looked at this chart to show what Medicare was paying, and this is inflation-adjusted price per inpatient stay. What happened? This was after the whole uh, managed care movement. So what we saw is Medicare staying pretty flat, but look what's happening to private pay. I asked Chapin White, PhD out of the Rand Corporation, who is heading up Medicare repricing work, and his answer was, because they could do it. <laughs> so our goal was to change the whole system, to no longer reimburse hospitals and providers by charge master less discount, but reimburse them by Medicare Plus. So we selected Medicare as a reference. We did this because it's a common reference, the largest payer. MedPAC gives the report to Congress every year. This last year they said that the average hospital will lose 9% on Medicare uh, reimbursements. Uh, the more efficient hospitals are making profits. Um, we did a lot of analysis on Medicare. We did analysis on our own state, which I'll show you. But we had some requirements with the Montana, uh, state of Montana plan. We did not want balanced billing, which meant we had to contract with every single hospital, so they would not balance bill our members. The governor and the executive branch legislature, too, preferred no steerage. In towns with two hospitals, don't just direct it to one hospital. Those employees are paying taxes, and you're working with taxpayer money. So try to figure out a way that you can include all hospitals. We needed quick results, and we wanted control over the trend going into the future. But I was the first time I had to work with state procurement regulations. And we could not direct contract, but we were very lucky. We put out an RFP for somebody to pay our claims and help us with the network contracting. We had nine respondents, and only one said they would do it. And that was Allegiance Benefit Management Systems here in Missoula, Montana. Ron Duznick, Dirk Gisser, Kim Brown worked so hard to support Sheila, myself, and Dan Bill, the budget director. And we marched forward and did it. So by uh, our target was July 2016. We started this in June of 2015. We had one year to get this done because I was not going to do this during a legislative session. I already was getting hit very hard by lobbying efforts from insurance companies and from hospitals. By the time we went live, we had all 48 critical access hospitals and we had 10 of the acute care hospitals under contract. The only holdout was Benefis. And it was a tough fight, but we were very fortunate. Sheila and Dan reached out to the union leadership and the union leadership really helped us. <coughs> the members turned their anger from me, being mad at me a little for the plan, to the hospital. We did publish the phone numbers of the CPLC <laughs> and their email addresses, and by August 6th, they signed. 
So this is what we found when we examined our claims, a year's worth of claims. This is outpatient. These are the 11 acute care hospitals. We, you can see that we found on the red line that there were about four hospitals within a certain range. But this is the average of the 11 hospitals. This is where it is on inpatient. Inpatient will find a little bit lower cost. There's been more control on those by Medicare and Medicaid and a little more focus, so you're going to see less variability. So our strategy became, this is blended, inpatient, outpatient. Could we look at that widespread and over three years, could we bring it down to a narrow and hit some of those more efficient hospital levels? And it would control the future trend. This chart shows you where the trend was headed in the dark color, and then the lighter color is with our pricing change, that we were only going to be increasing that price component by Medicare increases, no longer an arbitrary hospital mark. <coughs> now we found other efficiencies. We um, found that our PBM vendor was not exactly what we wanted, there was spread pricing they were keeping. We weren't getting all of our rebates. There were a lot of other issues, seven contracts. We terminated them. We went out for bid. We found one that would do a transparent pass-through pharmacy where we would have no spread. What we paid is what the pharmacist would get. We would get all of our rebates back, and we have full auditability. We went live. We immediately saved $7.4 million the first year. CVS would not agree to our terms. They wanted more money, so I kicked them out of the network. And CVS still is not in the state employee health plan network. With some of the savings, we created our own medical therapy management program. That is to reach out to uh, members to help them with their pharmacy needs to make sure there's adherence. And instead of going with a large vendor, a large PBM, we build our own solution with the Montana Community Pharmacists and the University of Montana Pharmacy School. Immediately, they identified 10% uh, of the members that needed assistance, and they're doing the outreach. It's been very successful. We beefed up our primary care. We have five on-site health centers. Access is there, no copay, no coinsurance for appointments, for x-ray, for labs, for health coaching. And their 20-minute appointments, they reach 73% of our population. The hospitals hate them. <laughs> because we have really also taken control of referrals to specialists there. So what happened in 2017? We didn't come in at minus 9 million. We had 112 million in reserves because of these efforts. So we surpassed even what we thought we would do. Now what I didn't expect is that our health plan would have more in reserves than the Montana General Fund. <laughs> so, so that summer was fine for me because they were borrowing money and I made sure they paid the statutory interest rate to me. And so we were doing fine. Uh, they then called a special session, passed Senate Bill 3, and uh, passed uh, a law to move $25.4 million of our reserves to the state of Montana to balance the budget. Now that's taxpayer money and it's going to other tax needs for the state. Now, even with that, the employees have had no changes in premiums, no changes in the out-of-pockets. In fact, they've had increased benefits for the five years ending in 2001. Uh, this year, the plan expects to put about $16 million in reserves. The actuary has said he's going to change his, uh, the factors he uses because we're just not coming in with that price trend he bought. So there'll probably be more going into reserves, and they're at this point not expecting increases for the next biennium either. So now I'm working on national efforts. And uh, I work for the National Academy of State Health Policy. We work mainly with uh, state policies. Um, we, um, there are some states I'm working with directly. Um, and I won't go into detail on these, but uh, a lot of states are moving forward with growth caps. So we're working uh, mostly with Rhode Island and Maryland right now. Uh, tra we're going transparency beyond prices. That's following where the money goes in the hospitals. The enormous millions of dollars of profits made on 340B, where the hospital pays one penny for Umera, and a plan pays them $5,000. And that spread is to be used for the low-income and indigent, but there's no reporting requirements, so are they using that? 
<clears throat> Another transparency thing, great fact here, MACPAC just gave a report to uh, Congress and they showed by state reimbursements of Medicaid costs. Montana shows that Medicaid reimbursements are covering 100% of Medicaid costs because of the supplemental payments. If you look at just those Medicaid reimbursements, they're covering 79% uh, of Medicaid and uninsured. So when hospitals come back to you and say, well, we can't survive unless we get 611% of Medicare, you know that they're getting their costs covered. We're looking strongly at community benefit programs. Uh, we have states that are putting requirements. Florida's got a law on the table to really balance that with the tax benefit that is going to these hospitals. You're getting a property tax benefit. Uh, how does that equate to the community benefit? I was just in Texas and saw a hospital um, gave $5 million to the community benefit that counted towards an offset to their tax exemption. It was $5 million to help build a football stadium for a high school team. Now in Texas, that probably is a real big thing. <laughs> but I think that it's up to legislators to start looking. They're buying this. Legislators are buying that community benefit with this tax benefit. Look at property ownership. How much property do not-for-profit hospitals own that are really used for retail? The lease payments they receive, not taxable income. There's a lot to be looked at there. Facility fees I won't go into. Kendall Cotton, I worked with him at the commissioner's office, is here as an expert on it. State and health employee health plans are getting a lot of attention by governors and legislators. I was just talking today to Washington. We're watching the for through Nashville, we're watching the different governors' uh, state of the state speeches. The Washington governor came out pretty loud and strong that he definitely is looking at the state employee health plan, so we're working with them. Uh, just one little quick story, we're working with Tennessee. This is an interesting one. The Tennessee employee state health plan was getting ready to renew their TPA contract. And they thought, should we go out for bid or should we just renew the contracts we have for another year? And they have both Blue Cross Blue Shield and Cigna. And when they started looking at their claims payment, they thought, there's some irregularities here. We've got to get into this a little bit. So they requested uh, data from both Cigna and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Both of those companies filed lawsuit against the Tennessee Director of State Finance and 100 employees. They said that this request violates the Sherman antitrust laws, as well as the U.S. Constitution. And a judge just offered to stay. So we're working with them. Uh, in their court, I looked at their court documents today. They said that the information is extremely competitively sensitive, valuable, confidential, proprietary, and trade secret. So what information you can you have as a payer? Because that those taxpayer dollars and members are making those payments. The insurance companies are middlemen that are just processing that. Finally, I'll just talk about the happy bill that I got to work on that with Kendall from the insurance commissioner's office this year. We called it the happy bill, the hospital and payment, uh, or hospital and provider payment initiative. I think we were the only ones happy about it because what it said is hospitals, you cannot bill more than 250% of Medicare. But if you do, you need to go through an appeals process. Now, we launched that bill by a surprise attack, and we took it to the House committee, and the House committee immediately passed it, 16 to 3. They loved it. And we had all this data to show what the reimbursements were. But immediately, the Montana Medical Association, along with one of the very large insurance companies in the state, and... Um, uh, they immediately launched a voter portal, they lobbied all night, and by the time it got to the House floor, it was defeated. With representatives saying, we can't do this to hospitals, we can't do this even to insurance companies. But I'm surprised other states are reaching out to me. I was just on a long call with a very large state who wants to move forward with that bill elsewhere. So, one more thing really quick on the surprise bills. This just came out. This just came out February 11th in a JAMA article about surprise bills. And what they did was look at roughly 350,000 patients who had one of seven elective surgeries.
They looked at just one insurance carrier's bill across the nation to see where there might be what they called surprise bills. That's when an out-of-network provider is participating in the surgical treatment. And I listed some of them there. So they looked at the claims to say, where is there a potential for a surprise bill? And they found an average of 20%. But look, at Montana is one of the darkest states, which means we're right on the top, 26 to 47% chance of a surprise bill. So we're also working on that. And I'm done. I don't think we have time for you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Marilyn, uh, set me up, would you please? I'm going to sit down. I, I never did one of these without a under 30-year-old tagged along with me. So I, I'm, uh, I'm under 30. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, young Marilyn that's working with me. I, I said I'm a transparency guy in a PowerPoint world. I'd rather right, do transparencies. Don't put me on the clock yet. <laughs> Uh, I want to acknowledge a few few friends of mine that I see in the audience. Uh, Jan Van Riper up in the audience uh, was the first executive director of the NASHCO, National Alliance of State Health Co-ops. My friend Bernard Komenko, I think I saw Bernard come in. He's up there. And I have a cousin and cousin-in-law who are going to do the Julia Roberts whoo, 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 thing for me So when I hit home runs. So... Uh, anyway, my name's Jim Edwards. Uh, my wife is Sheila Hogan, who uh, worked with Maryland at DPHHS and previously at uh, Department of Admin that ran the state health plan. Uh, I've been a health care consultant. I met Dr. Roberts because our company was a, the consultant to the, uh, 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 not Western Missoula, Montana Western Montana Clinic, and then we recruited Tom. When my partner and I started the Montana Health Co-op, he was one of our first recruits to be our medical director and be on the board. Okay, so uh, I'm going to dumb this down. Health insurance is very esoteric. Unless you live in this world, you do not understand it. But I'm going to make it, it, it's not that complicated. If you work for an employer and uh, uh, your employer sponsored your health insurance plan, so that employer had a couple different ways to provide insurance for you. A traditional way would be to go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and have an insurance policy for you all. And this is as simple as it works. When it comes time to determine what next year's rates are going to be, the health insurer says, well, what were the claims that were processed and paid on behalf of the plan participants that worked at that employer group? over the last 12 months. they got to have a time period. And what were the premiums that we brought in? So the, the numerator is the claims costs, and the no denominator is the premiums, okay? So that equals then a loss ratio. And you'd think, well, 100% might be okay, right? If, if I, you didn't pay out any more than, uh, than I paid you, but that, that's not really so good. I also put over here, this was an article in, uh, I think it was in April of 13, a Time article devoted entirely to the cost of health care. Because what the universal theme here is the problem with insurance premiums is health care costs. They're linked at the hip. They're, there's, there's just nothing separating. Okay. This was a client of ours. This is why I'm no longer in the business. How would you like to go to this client that has 230 employees that's providing health insurance for their employees and their covered dependents and spending between the employer's costs and their employees' contributions to those premiums, right? We all pay. Usually a norm would be an employer might pay the employee rate, but if I add my spouse Maybe I pick that up, and if I add my family, I pick up that. Combined, those are the total premiums that get paid in. They get paid monthly. There are four tiers of enrollment. There's employee only. There's employee plus my spouse. There's employee plus my child or children. And there's my employee, my employee plus family. So four tiers. And a family usually is about 300% of what a single employee is. Anyway, you roll up those enrollments in 12 months of premiums, in this particular group, they had over the period October 14 through September of 15, they paid in 
two million one hundred eighty thousand dollars. It happened to be allegiance. No, no particular reason allegiance. They just happened to be the carrier here, but they had two point eight million dollars of claims. So the carrier lost a lot of money. 133% loss ratio when the insurance carrier had the un underwriters go through the underwriting process they said those claims next year because of inflation will probably go higher here's what Allegiance said if we're going to insure that group next year on the same level of benefits they're going to have to have a 74.9 kind of Kmart pricing right instead of 75 it's 74.9 <laughs> But, but you're going to pay 70. Well, what employer, if you do the math, that's, that's a million and a half dollars extra premium. That wipes out that company's entire profit and the next year's and the next year's profit. It doesn't work, does it? So when you think about why did my employer raise my deductible? Why did my employer raise my copay? Why did my employer raise my out of pocket, my prescription copays? Because up here in the numerator, the 2.8 million, if I can change what gets paid by the plan to what you pay as the plan participant, it doesn't end up in the numerator, right? So that's the way that you moderate what a rate increase is going to be. This is kind of how you put together a premium. We figure about 75, 78% of the dollars in the premium are going to be expected to be paid out in claims. About 15% is what the insurance carrier needs for their employees, for their rent, for you know, uh, cleaning their parking lot, all of their operating expenses. And then we have taxes, we pay an insurance agent, a commission, et cetera. But anyway, that rolls it up into what a premium would be, okay? Uh, Marilyn talked about networks, and she said something along the line of, we wanted to go to the hospitals and we wanted to negotiate a deal with the hospitals. But it had to be a deal so that whatever we negotiated, they couldn't come back and say, well, we're going to bill your employee the overage. Okay, so you all have an insurance card, Blue Cross or Allegiance or Montana Co-op or whatever you have, and you've been told over the years you want to go to a participating provider, a network provider. There are a couple benefits. One, if you go to a network provider, you know that if they charged a thousand dollars and Blue Cross said the maximum allowance we're going to pay for that is five hundred dollars and you have an 80-20 plan, you're going to pay twenty percent your share of five hundred dollars. So you're going to pay four hundred dollars but that extra $500 between what was charged and what was allowed, that's gone. That's a network discount. That's a savings to you. So, it, so going in network does two things. It saves you from having exposure to a balance bill where the carrier says you owe me more money or the provider, the hospital says you owe me more money or the doctor does. But to your employer, and if you're more than 200 employees, when you pay premiums, you pretty much pay premiums to support what your employees and the covered dependents are going to spend. So it's not miraculous. Somebody else isn't going to pay your freight. If you're 200 employees in Montana or larger, the premiums that you're going to pay are going to be commensurate with what the insurance company thinks your claims costs are going to be. So again, I made a good living by advising employers on how are we going to shrink that numerator, that claims cost, so that the denominator, the premiums, can be lower? Here we have a deal that Blue Cross said, hey, we have a $256,000 claim. Blue Cross, God bless them, they got a 5.6% discount, right? $14,000 discount. But what the problem is, is $241,601 made its way to the numerator in the claim side. So the discount that Blue Cross afforded me as the plan sponsor, the employer that's paying the freight through my contributions and my employees, not a very big deal, really. That's a lot of money to make its way to the numerator. Let me show you the, one of the more egregious claims that I dealt with. Uh, this is a claim, it's about eight years old, this is a, a plant participant on one of my clients. Um, this particular individual 
uh, was, had an infusion for cancer. If you look, if I can do this, uh, the date of this service is 11 28 12. 11, uh, this was uh, an office, so this was done from an oncologist office, a private oncologist, not associated with a hospital. The oncologist charged 12100 for that infusion. Blue Cross, again, God bless them, they did a great job. They said, we're only going to allow 7700 So there was a discount on this claim of $4,000. This was every three weeks for this individual. This claim was every three weeks. We followed this claim, all right, because we're trying to help our client manage their dollars that are being spent. We're trying to manage the numerator. We look, and on 1219, we see that instead of $12,000 being billed, we have almost 29,000. So three weeks later, it went from 12 to 29. Blue Cross is continuing to be the claims administrator, and they've continued to do a wonderful job getting my client a discount on this charge. So what they did is they said, well, we can't afford to pay you. Shit, excuse me. <laughs> excuse my French. I, I am a Bose, or MSU graduate, so. <laughs> so, uh, so instead of 28,000, they, what the hell? All right. Okay. Uh, instead of 28, we're gonna allow 25. 25,000 is now what we're going to pay the same doctor, the same drug, on the same person. But the change has been that the hospital acquired that physician. So instead of an office build, it was hospital built. You know what the difference is between the 7 and the 25 annually? $315,000. To this employer on this individual. It was simply an extraction from our client because next year when their rates come out that's going to be in the numerator. That for this client resulted in, in an additional 33 percent rate increase. I called Blue Cross. I said what in the hell? They said well that's our contracted rate. That's, that's our deal. I said that's ridiculous. They said that's our deal. And like Marilyn said, this is done in a black box. It's supposed to be a good thing for you all. I called the hospital CFO and I said, we cannot pay this. This, this, this customer, they pay me good money to advise them we're not going to pay that. That's our deal. I said, well, listen, I don't have any alternatives. So that what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a letter. This happened to be in Billings. I live in Hell. I said, we're going to write a letter, an editorial to the Billings Gazette, and I'm going to explain this. And we're going to out you for what you're doing here. Well, we got it down to 12,000. We got it down to 12,000. It was a great success, believe it or not. Uh, what's the problem? The problem is that Blue Cross and Blue Shield and our insurance carriers negotiate deals on our behalf that I can hardly look you in the eye and tell you that in, they're in your best interest. They're not, okay? What we need is more visibility and more honesty in what costs. I, my wife and I both had LASIK surgery about 16 years ago. We went to Great Falls. We shopped it. We went to Great Falls. Today, the same LASIK surgery we had done is done for about 30 cents on the dollar because it's out there and we can shop it. Uh, Marilyn, this is your... Oh, what I would contend to you all is we've had stagnant wages for a very long time. And why? I'll tell you what I believe is the reason. It's because a small employer trying to do right by his or her employees paying their insurance. And he's decided, I want to give everybody a buck raise. I want to give my key people a two buck raise next year. Some agent comes to them and says, January 1, your rates are going up 42%. And they say, we can't do that. What can we do? Well, we can raise your deductible. We can raise your copay. So you do all those, and you come down to a 20% increase. What just happened, the bucket of compensation that the employer has to pay you is 
one bucket, and it can either be paid in salary or benefits. And if it goes to benefits, like Marilyn said, there's no money for salary. It's a big problem. This is, uh, this is uh, Marilyn's case. I'm very familiar with the state of Montana. My wife was uh, in cohorts with, with Marilyn. We should all give Marilyn a, an applause before the day is over for what she did for us all. This is a graph of premiums for state of Montana employees. The key point I want to make here is that only 5% of this chart is attributable to the health insurance carrier or administrative costs. 95% of this trend line is a function of increase in health care costs. So if you go back to 1980, a good benefit for at the state of Montana cost the state, and you as an employee got 60 bucks towards that cost. When Maryland got there, it was up around 887. If this trend continues at the same 9% in 35 years, the same medical trend inflation of 9% says every month the state will need to pony up $13,113 to pay for health insurance for these people. But it's flat now. Yeah, thanks to Maryland, it's flat now. So thank you. <laughs> That's Jim's. Uh, secondarily, there is a million dollar <laughs> reward. If anybody can find a cell phone that's <laughs> sitting out there uh, somewhere, maybe in this building. A cell phone that's been lost since I got here, okay? So, <laughs> million, a million dollars. It's going to be paid a buck a year for a million years, but it's a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I am the last one, so hopefully we can get some questions quickly. Um, so, about money in healthcare. Um, A couple of disclosures. I'm, my name is Mark Mentel, family doc. Um, been practicing for 30 years. Um, first confession uh, I have to make is I'm a terrible businessman. Um, throughout my career as a doc, I've found ways to get paid less and less, <laughs> work with the hardest and the hardest population, and work with less and less uh, availability of resources. Um, I thought I was at the lowest point in my career working as a professor for family medicine residency in a federally qualified health center. Nope, I found a lower spot. <laughs> I found a way to actually, I had a job at Western Montana Mental Health Center working with what I call the eyes patients in our community. And what do I mean by eyes patients? These are the marginalized, stigmatized, criticized, ostracized, and criminalized patients in our society. These are the people no one wants to work with. And we're working with them with the lowest bit of shoestrings. Um, as a businessman, I've also known that there's this aspect of there's two types of jobs in the world. That to feed your belly, that you need to do so you can have food on the table. And there's that which feeds your soul. And I've been lucky enough to have been feeding my soul for my entire career. Um, second, I'm an osteopath. If any of you know anything about osteopathy, um, it was started by a physician, Dr. E.P. Still, back in the 1850s. And believe it or not, this has relevance today. Um, at that time, in 1850, around the Civil War time, he was looking around and noticed that he was an MD. He looked, you know, by God, the people that live in the counties, they don't have a doctor, they seem to be living longer, and the children don't die. What's going on? So he started to form medicine called osteopathy. The philosophy was diet, exercise, good health, living a good, clean life, um, belonging, sense of purpose, may have more to do with anything. Um, and so his, his philosophy was that the body is a self-healing unit. It can heal itself if given the opportunity. The role of medicine is merely just to guide it. Um, and he formed a philosophy. In order to treat the whole body or the human being as a person, you need to treat their mind, body, and soul. Unless you treat all three of those things, you will never get any meaningful results. Lastly, everything you're about to hear is biased 100% <laughs> by my life experience and education. So that's 30 years practicing as a doc and 24 years as education. So I've worked everywhere from 
as a doctor in the Navy, a doctor from the National Service Corps. I've been an employed physician. I've run my own business. Um, been a professor, and now I consider myself a Homo sapien wildlife biologist. <laughs> so that is one of the questions I want you guys to consider. Why I consider myself a wildlife um, uh, a Homo sapien wildlife biologist. <laughs> Um, so, assumptions and presumptions. Um, when I started doing this, I was thinking about, man, there's so much waste in the healthcare system. What do we do if we get that waste taken out? What are we going to do with it? How's it going to work? And I believe 100% in everything my panelists said. They are absolutely correct. There's a lot of waste in the system. The question is, what do we do once we get rid of that waste? And I'm going to make the argument, even if we eliminate the waste, there is not enough money left that will really take care of our population. In fact, there's not enough money right now that can take care of our population. And I'm going to go into that argument, and here's a couple of reasons why. We have some presumptions. Why do we have most of health, the most expensive healthcare system but doesn't deliver the best results? Well, one, we're comparing ourselves to Europeans. We are not Europeans. We're a completely different society with a different, totally different set of conditions going on. We are not even close. And then I started thinking, you know, if we save that money, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to save it. But there's, there's a saying that I like to think about with my quality health person that I work with. You know, if you're a fisherman in the river and you're fly fishing, and every now and then you have to keep pulling another fly fisherman out of the river because he's drifting downstream with his waders full of water, and you do that time 40 times over and over, it might be a good idea for you to get out of the river, walk upstream two miles, and find out why the fishermen are falling in the first place. That's what we need to be looking at. And so, what if our healthcare system is too large? What if we have, as in, was it, it may have been Eisenhower, uh, the medical industrial complex or the military industrial complex? What if we have ourselves going a medical industrial complex going on? What if our consumption of healthcare is different? I'm going to make an argument. We consume medicine completely different than any other country in the world. What if our system doesn't distribute healthcare equally or appropriately? And lastly, what if we have one of the unhealthiest first world populations to begin with? So let's start right here. What if our healthcare system is too large? I was just looking the other day, just looking, what are the hottest jobs for any grad to get? These are the top 100 best jobs. Software developer, okay, cool, I can deal with that. You need to be moving more to an information technology. Next, you have dentist, healthcare. Next, you have physician assistant, healthcare. Next, you have orthodontist, healthcare. Next, you have nurse practitioner, healthcare. Next, you have statistician, not quite healthcare, but every healthcare needs a statistician so they can figure out how to apply costs. Every insurance company needs a statistician to figure out how. So, yeah, they're not quite there in healthcare directly, but they're one degree of separation away. Uh, number seven, decision. Um, next, speech language pathologist. Next, oral maxillofacial surgeon. Last, veterinarian. Veterinarian, not quite, but I try to keep approaching my vet saying, can you please take me out as a patient? You're much more cost effective than me taking out if you get anywhere else. Um, top 10 most in job, most, top 10 most in demand jobs, home health aid, healthcare, physical therapist, healthcare, registered nurse, healthcare, uh, healthcare, software engineer, not quite, but one degree of separation because they develop a lot of their IT that we need to be able to supposedly communicate with one another. Uh, information security analysis, again, one degree of separation from healthcare. They need to be involved so we make sure all their healthcare and private information is safe. Occupational therapist, web developer, we need to get our lines up so we can make sure that they know about us, we're competing for those dollars, we're, comparing for your, we're competing for your healthcare interests. Data scientists, do those. Operations managers, they're the ones who are the admin for most of our hospitals. Uh, diagnostic medical sonographer. You can see there's a Big, huge, there's a big chunk of people involved in healthcare. So we're talking about eliminating 25% of waste. We're also eliminating 25% of jobs. There's an equation. One man's waste is another man's job. And so as we go down through this and eliminate waste, we've got to take, 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 into, that, take into the aspect that some of this means jobs. What if our consumption of healthcare is different? I love this study. This was recently out of JAMA in 2019, they compared three countries, the US, Canada, and Sweden. And what they did is compared um, what 
percentage of patients actually filled their opioid prescription after having surgery. They compared the four same surgeries. Uh, the surgeries were laparoscopic cholecystectomy, having your gallbladder removed through little ports. Um, arthroscopic knee menisectomy, having your knee operated on. Uh, laparoscopic appendectomy. Um, and breast excision. What they find, they, the age ranges were about similar. Some of the countries had a little bit difference in male versus female. Um, in the U.S., there was 130,000 people they studied. Canada, um, about 85,000. Sweden, about 10,000. What did they find? Well, Canada seemed to fill the most prescriptions after this. 79% of the patients in Canada filled their prescriptions for an opioid. In the U.S., we had 76% filled their prescriptions for opioid. In Sweden, 11%. They consume healthcare completely different. They look at getting sick completely different. Guess how many countries in the world have direct-to-consumer advertising for pills? <laughs> Two, actually. New Zealand's another one. They actually have tighter uh, restrictions on what can be advertised. The U.S. is only one. I can guarantee you, in any other country, you never hear this conversation in a doctor's office. So, Mr. Jones, what do you want today? Doc, there's this really cool new pill I want to get. I think I need it. I have all the symptoms. I have this, this, this. And like, James, you don't need that. I do so. No, you don't. Yes, I do. And my insurance will pay for it. I got good insurance. I want that. I want that pill now. Get it to me. Oh, my God. I got two minutes. I'll get through this as quickly as possible. Um, there's a consumer demand. And in the U.S., we focus more on pills and not skills, life behavior. Um, what if your healthcare system doesn't distribute healthcare equally or proportionally? This is a map of life expectancy by county in the, in the, in the United States. Those that are the darkest red have the lowest life expectancy. Those the lightest has the um, longest life expectancy. You'll see that the red is anywhere from 56 to 75 years of age is your life expectancy. Um, light orange, or the darker orange, 75 to 78 is your life expectancy. Lighter orange, 78 to 80, and really light is 81. In fact, it's so accurate that actually your life expectancy is more based on your zip code than on anything else you have. Um, I can nail down your life expectancy within one or two years and be 90% accurate just based on your zip code. I don't need to know anything else. I want to move to where it's a longer And what if we're one of the unhealthiest world, first world countries? The U.S. life expectancy is the only industrialized country that's seen a decrease in their life expectancy. The past two years we made a little right bound. We gained about two months. But prior to that, we had a five-year slump. We lost life expectancy. I can tell you why. Um, most of those were deaths between the ages of 25 and 64. Um, one was from chronic liver disease. Another one was suicide. Another one was drug overdose. What do they all have in common? Substances. Liver disease, hepatitis C, which is making resurgence from all the IV drug use. And then you also have um, alcohol use disorder not being detected. Um, you have suicide, depression, um, and we're seeing a decline. We made a little bit of that up. Half Americans will be at peace within the next 10 years, study says, unless we work together. Right now, our obesity rate in the U.S. is approaching 40%. In Europe, it's only about a little less than 20%. U.S. among the most depressed countries in the world. And a new survey shows Americans are unhappier than they've ever been in years. So here's U.S. obesity rates um, based on where you live. And if you kind of notice that red area where the obesity rates are the highest, that also happens to be where life expectancy was shortest. Um, Colorado's a golden area. Um, they're just slightly heavier than most Europeans. Um, the prevalence of mental illness is higher in our country than most other industrialized countries. And it all has to do with separation of wages. The gap between the rich and the poor are actually increasing our happiness. <coughs> Our mental illness rate is way above 25%. And I'd say it's even higher because we're not considering a lot of substance uses. When I was talking about, uh, you could actually look at your zip code as far as life expectancy, the difference was 20 years. But when it broke down to differences, it all broke down to if you're rural and poor, 
your life expectancy was in the lower range. If you're wealthy and urban, you had a twenty, you had about twenty years of higher life expectancy. Addiction and unhappiness in America. There's an there's a happiness index you can pull up. Um, this was what was called, quoted. As I noted in last, and this was a quote. As I noted in last year's World Happiness Report, the long-term rise in U.S. income per person has been accompanied by several trends adverse to subjective well-being. Worsening health conditions for much of the population, declining social trust, and declining confidence in government. Whatever benefits and subjective well-being might have appeared accrued as a result of rising incomes seem to have been offset by these adverse trends. This year, I propose a common driver of many of America's social maladies, a mass addiction society. Here's the top 10 leading causes of death. Heart disease, and I can guarantee you everything I just talked about, the three diseases, obesity, depression, mental illness, substance abuse, is a main contributor to all of our top 10. Heart disease, smoking, that's a bad substance. Stress, anxiety, not good for your blood pressure. Mental illness, not good either. Cancer, the heavier you are, the more likely you are to have cancer. This is a common fact. Carcinogens concentrate in fat tissue. It just happens, and that's one of the things you got to consider. It's also not good for your overall blood pressure. It's also not overall good for anything that goes along with um, um, heart or vascular conditions. Unintentional injuries is number three. Car accidents, automobile accidents, not doing a good uh, job. A lot of times those have substances on board. Chronic lung disease, smoking again, substance. Um, stroke and cerebral vascular disease, again, substances, stress, anxiety. Alzheimer's disease, I have a stop, but I only have a couple more slides, so if you guys will bear with me, I'll come and see. Um, Alzheimer's disease, again, most of Alzheimer's, or a lot of it, is what we call vascular dementia. So a lot of it has to do with blood flow and blood vascular disease, so these things all play a role. Diabetes, influenza and pneumonia. This one has more to do with health disparities. You saw the health disparities of areas. If you're poor and rural, can't get access to influenza vaccines or pneumonia vaccines, you're more likely to come down with that disease. You're also, because you won't have health care access there, your likelihood of surviving a pneumonia is much lower. Kidney disease, again related to vascular stuff, and suicide, number 10. It's the first time it broke into the number 10 slot. So, as I said, I'm an osteopath. Here's a picture of E.T. Still. He's my mentor. He's the guy I believed in. Um, and I think any one of us can find disease. But what he had was the same, to find health, should be the object of the physician. Anyone can find disease. We're able to point out all the problems, but can anyone define what health looks like? Do any of us have any direction where we're going with once we fix this healthcare system, we fix this venue? Where are we going to spend it on? What direction are we going to go? What are we going to do? <clears throat> and since this is the League of Women Voters, this picture right here of the first graduating class from AT Still University, there were six women. <laughs> <laughs> had a different philosophy that women should be intricately involved in the, in the um, medical system. So here's a question I have. What do people, and as an osteopath, I'm going to give you the answer. Here's the answer to what really we should be focusing on. What do people who live in Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan, I carry in Greece, and on the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica have in common with seven-day advanced mobile into California? <laughs> they're all, they're all they're all all exactly. And this is stuff you guys have heard before, but this is true. They're blue zones. What are blue zones? What's a blue zone? Here. The blue zones. I can't remember. Um, can we have door prizes for the blue zones? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Keep going. So, blue zones. So, these are areas where people live completely differently. They haven't adapted to Western society. They, have, they still live more of an agrarian society. They get moderate, regular physical activity on a daily basis. So this isn't stuff that they consume. They buy a gym pass and go to a gym. Activity is built into their daily routine. They have a life purpose. They have a reason for why they want to get up every morning. They found a purpose. They've learned how to reduce stress. They get moderate caloric intake. In fact, in Okinawa, Japan, they have a, and I'm going to get it really wrong, it's, I think it's called Hare Kucha Habari, something like that. But it means eight, eat to your 80% full, is what they do. So they don't go full full, they just eat to 80% full. Um, they have a plant-based diet, moderate alcohol intake, especially wine. They're engaged in spirituality or religion, engaged in family life, and engaged in social life. 
That's the secret. There's a lot of things in our society that aren't conducive to that. Sedentary, sitting at a desk, gaining weight, eating fast food, <coughs> that's what's going to kill our healthcare industry. Until we start looking at the society in which, I'm going to give you the answer. So you guys ask me why, why am I a uh, homo sapien wildlife biologist? I'm not trying to save an individual. I'm trying to save a species. And if I keep putting, if I keep fishing fishermen out of the river every time they fall in, just throw them back in so they can fall back in again, that's not helpful. What is helpful is finding why they're falling in in the first place. And we need to look upstream. We need to look at those things, and we need to change how we live our lives. Our bodies, whether you uh, uh, believe in evolution or whether you believe in creation, we were designed to live in a different world than what we have right now. And there are things we need to change in a lot of social policies that we're saying. We're going to be, I try not to get on that, but we can fix, we can increase 25% healthcare, but I don't think it's going to be enough to fix the direction where society's going to move more. So, so much for getting four people to speak for 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, I think we're going to try to, so we should really try to end this at uh, 8.30, I mean, we said we would. We have, we have a number of questions. Um, I think what I'm going to do is um, say that Mark, you already answered yours. Yes. <laughs> Which, uh, is it possible to reduce costs through a focus on long-term health and wellness programs? So I think you address that. And, yes. Um, that's what I'd like to speak on a little bit more for <laughs> answering your questions. So I have I have three questions, and I'm going to ask uh, each of the remaining three panelists um, one question, and then we'll uh, call it, and you guys can come up and talk to us afterwards. So Maryland, <clears throat> the state of Maryland, um, I think it's spelled different. The state yeah. of Maryland? Yeah. yeah. I'm now a state. <laughs> As a regulatory division of DPHHS that determines the prices hospitals can charge, they have the second lowest prices in the country, and all 52 hospitals are still open for business. Could we have this in Montana? Um, I, um, I have not studied the Maryland plan enough, so I really can't speak to it. But I think that there are a lot of alternative payment systems, a lot of models out there. And uh, I say absolutely, absolutely. Now, in Maryland, it's price setting, and a uh, board does that. Uh, but I really don't know that much about it. You probably know more about Maryland. No, I don't. No. They've got an overall board that determines. Yeah, they have, and, and so does Massachusetts with their growth cap. You have health right. authority boards in different states. If there's any chance at all? I mean, you have a lot of experience in the state uh, of Montana that um, legislatively uh, we could get something that looked like it was universal cost control, um, like done by limiting the hospitals. Mm -hmm in terms of their uh, profits, or are I, we just stuck? I, mean, we I think just... Dick could probably answer that better than I can with the legislature. I'm seeing it in other states. I'm seeing states really go to growth caps, which um, I'm not an, an advocate for those unless you get rid of the waste first. Massachusetts has a 3.1% growth cap on total care, but it's really just pharmacy hospital provider. So it cannot go up more than 3.1%. But then they had double digit increases in insurance premiums. Now Rhode Island is rolling out a law with a health authority saying that they're trying to regulate it through the insurance companies. They're saying insurers, you cannot raise your premiums more than 3% per year. You figure out how to do it and you start negotiating different. So there's a lot of things going out there in different states. You've got uh, public option plans starting up uh, in Washington. Colorado's fussing with one now of uh, just a public option. Anybody can go buy insurance there, and hospitals will be priced at a percentage of Medicare. So there are a lot of different alternative states are trying to do, and they balance between trying to get out of this protected, opaque system into more competitive markets, or you can go the whole other direction to price setting. So we're seeing a lot through all the different states. A lot of different options. 
yeah. states that are potential for for, the, for our future mm -hmm. controlling this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thanks for your work. Well, Dick, I've got a different question for you, but you're last. Hey, Dick. Um, <laughs> Jim, um, I like this question. Uh, what are the incentives for health insurance companies to reduce prices compared to the incentives to allow prices to rise? Which is a stronger incentive and why? Okay, so in uh, health insurance is uh, delivered through employers probably uh, uh, the biggest way most of us, I think, work for employers that probably provided our health insurance. Yes or no, uh, most of us. No, more employers that provide health insurance today, if you're a hundred, if you, you work for an employer that's a hundred employees or larger, there's every likelihood that you're not buying what's called an insured product through Blue Cross and Blue Shield or through Pacific Source. The more likelihood is that you're buying what we call a partially self-funded health insurance plan. You wouldn't know any difference. You wouldn't know any difference. But the larger employers are providing insurance through partially self-funded plans. And that means why I liked to work in that world is I got to look at my client's claim. So I got to discover the individual that was paying $7,700, and then it went to $25,000, then I got to intervene. That was how I brought value to my clients. If that was a off-the-shelf product through Blue Cross and Blue Shield, that was all in a black box. I would so never does know Blue that. Blue Cross not have any incentive to lower those prices? I'm going to I'm going to go You're right there. To that. Yeah. So one of the, one of the unintended consequences of the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. neither good, neither good nor bad. Uh, okay, uh, Affordable Care Act was good because it got a lot more people insured, and historically our state had about 20 21 percent uninsured. That initiative brought the uninsured population down to about seven percent. So a lot of the uncompensated or indigent care that our hospitals provided, they now got paid for. Well, when they didn't get paid for, that got cost shifted onto those of us that had insurance. They just said, well, if you're not going to pay me, we're going to get it from those folks. So it raised the, the reimbursement. The flaw with the Obamacare was this. It said that on the individual marketplace, we're going to limit the health insurers from getting fat by we're going to uh, not allow them to make more than 20%. They can only have a 20% retention on their individual policyholders and a 15%, they can only keep 15% of every dollar on their, on their larger group stuff. So if you think about this, if you can only keep 15%, on a larger group. A group pays a million dollars, I can only keep 150,000 of it as the insurer. If I do a great job at holding the numerator down, the, the costs down, then every year I can only keep 150,000. My costs are gonna go up. So the unintended, this is me editorializing a little bit, but my belief, and I worked for Blue Cross, my business partner was the vice president of marketing at Blue Cross. We know a little bit about this, it's a built-in incentive to have inflation because as long as the costs are going up and I only get to keep 15%, one year I get to keep 15% of a million bucks. If costs go up to a million a hundred, I get to keep 15% of a million one hundred the next year. If they go up to a million three, I get to keep 15%. So I saw a shift personally of, of a little bit what I felt was the insurance companies working on my clients, their, their policyholders' behalf, and too big of a partnership with the hospitals. That, that's mm -hmm. what I believe has happened, Tom. I agree. So you and Marilyn agree that the incentives are for the insurance companies to raise the it's not the incentive. So that's what I believe, and, and there's an acronym that was mentioned called PBMs. That's an acronym for Pharmacy Benefit Managers. So uh, today you have Blue Cross, their pharmacy is done through an entity called Prime Therapeutics. So all the companies outsource this one function uh, of handling your pharmacy stuff to a PBM. The PBM <coughs> is a black box, and PBMs today are 20 cents on the dollar. So 20% of all of our healthcare costs, the numerator, are now pharmacy claims, and they're not very well regulated, Tom. Yeah. 
I didn't ask you that question, but Sorry. thank you for going there. I agree with him. Dick, uh, you have a choice of uh, those last two questions. So if you want to show us your slide about reform proposals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and with that, um, and discussion, and uh, we'll uh, walk out of here with a solution, finally. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, while Dick is messing around with his stuff, uh, how about if we have a show of hands for more questions after Dick? Uh, how about a show of hands for uh, it's time to go see how the Grizz did? Oh, how did somebody look at us? Not everybody has to stay. Yeah. <laughs> you can leave. You can walk I'll tell you what, why don't we do this? Why don't, um, why don't after Dick um, tells us the solution to these problems, we'll, um, we'll take just a minute or two, and if, uh, don't feel bad if you want to leave, uh, but if you want to stay for a little discussion, maybe we can just like stay here and have a discussion, uh, not even from the cards. Before people leave, then let me say a couple words. Sure. Um, well, I uh, I was cautioned that I had to be nonpartisan, uh, and so I'm not going to tell you what the solution is. I'm going to tell you what some of the solutions that are being proposed are, and you get to decide uh, whether you like them or not. So we'll go back to this slide. This is the, the current situation. So the first proposal that I want to look at would be... Uh, Senator's proposal for Medicare for all. And uh, if, you, if you think about it, then this is what the situation looks like now, and that's what it would look like uh, under, a, an, under Medicare for All. Uh, so, um, what kind of claims do you want to make about this? Or what kind of claims does Sanders want to make about this and as a solution? Uh, well, uh, one of the things is obviously uh, that uh, the question of, of affordable access is solved. Every, everybody's covered. Medicare for all, everybody's covered. So um, when we talk about is, does everybody have affordable access, yes. Um, in, and, and Sanders would argue that it lowers insurance overhead costs. Um, by simplifying the system, it lowers uh, those costs associated with complexity. And it, and it creates the possibility for uh, Medicare for All to use bargaining power to make arrangements um, to lower costs uh, within the healthcare system. So that's, that's, that's the argument that he would make in favor of, of this particular proposal. Um, what's what's on, the, on, the, on the downside of it? Well, I think uh, what's on the downside of it is that but one thing, what uh, Sanders has, has, has said is that most people, most first of all, you have to pay more taxes, obviously. <laughs> and this, this little arrow up there has to get a lot fatter. Uh, you've got to pay a lot more taxes. And since Sanders has said that um, for, for most people, for most people, the amount of additional taxes they pay will be less than the premiums that they're currently paying that will be eliminated. In other words, they'll come out ahead. That's, that's his claim. How can that work? Only, of course, by significantly increasing taxes on high income, on, on high income individuals. That, you know, obviously is something that Sanders is perfectly comfortable with. Uh, the only thing you have to look at is in terms of the political reality of it is that it flies in the face of, um, of what's happened to the taxation of high-income people for the last 50 years, uh, which is that it's come down. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, of course, the other um, feature of this is that if it's effective, if you can, in fact, dramatically reduce costs, there is that question of so somebody's cost is somebody else's job. Somebody's cost is somebody else's income. So there's a lot of um, 
political resistance that comes from insurance companies or hospitals or whatever uh, when they're placed under this kind of pressure to reduce costs. Um, and then the fi finally, um, of course, is the issue raised by Pete Buttigieg and uh, other uh, Democratic candidates, which is people want to keep the, the, the covers they have right now. Uh, and this, as you saw, just eliminated all that other kind of coverage that people have right now. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, there's, a, there's another possibility, going back to the thing, and that, that is, this is the, the approach that I would call um, is, is, is more amorphous than a specific proposal from Sanders, but it's the, it's the Republican approach, uh, which is to de-emphasize, I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way, is to de-emphasize the public side. You know, put less money into, the, into, into public insurance programs and rely more on private insurance programs. And, uh, it combines with a whole bunch of other stuff. It's not just that you're going to put less money into public programs, but it also combines with uh, increasing price transparency, um, increasing the variety of insurance programs that are available to people, or insurance products that are available to people, medical savings accounts, um, uh, relying more on uh, people's direct payments, the idea here is, um, that inspires this is the idea that um, you want to you want to make patients consumers. Um, you want them to and you want them to behave like consumers, uh, so that they can they'll they'll, they'll go out and uh, be uh, and, and impose competitive pressure on providers and, and low costs. Uh, it may work, it may not. Um, my inclination is to say, no, it won't work. And I, and I think that it's probably unlikely to. So maybe that was part of it. Uh, uh, and, and it's likely to. to uh, it's, it's very hard for me to imagine that you can maintain universal, affordable uh, access to healthcare uh, on, on that basis. Um, you have to have some public money going into it. And that might go, in, in this scheme of things, that might go into, say, um, public subsidies for high-risk pools, and things of that sort. Um, and then, uh, the, the, there's, in between those two extremes, there's a number of other proposals. One is, the, is to take, is to turn into Medicare. <coughs> what is that doing over there? Uh, into uh, the public option. Oh dear. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just finish. It's to change Medicare to the public option. Um, um, already referred to the public option uh, and how that works. Um, and then uh, there are a number of proposals that simply involve um, sort of trying to beef up o Obamacare and the ACA in place as it is right now uh, by doing things like restoring the individual mandate. Um, putting more money into the subsidies, uh, putting, uh, allowing um, low-income families in states that have failed to adopt uh, Medicaid expansion, um, allowing those, fam those families to, to, look, to go onto the exchanges. Um, this, is, this is essentially patching up um, the, the holes that have been punched in the ACA or the holes that are already were there in the ACA. Um, in order to assure um, uh, affordable access, but much less much less focus on the cost side. So those are the those, the, those are the options. Thoughts. I think I think I'm feeling it. So um, <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting we're approaching the end. I don't want to torture you. So why don't you? Uh, you have to tell us what you need to know, and uh, we'll be down here if you guys want to come and say hi and ask us questions and talk to us. Uh, thanks so much for coming yeah. for your attention, your nice questions. To you, um, yes. It's a to have so many speakers here. I um, want to thank the League, uh, Rockford, and the Chimpanzee Center. Uh,
Uh, we are Montana's new to a and we try to connect the dots between money and influence and the critical issues of our times. Um, we hope to present more panels uh, following the money and what have you uh, in other important areas and welcome your interest in participation. Please feel free to sign the clipboards at the back to learn more um, and to get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. So thanks a lot. Yeah.